Okay guys, I wanted to do a video for this question of the day because you'll probably see something just like this on the GED test. Now, you might find it hiding in a word problem, uh, but you will probably have a problem where you're asked to find a missing side, so a missing side to a right triangle. So how do I know that this triangle is a right triangle? Well, we know it's a triangle because it has three sides, but it's a right triangle because it has this perfect right angle, this 90 degree angle. Okay, a right angle is what you want your carpenter to build in your house. You know, your house is going to be all slanted if you don't have these nice right angles. Okay, so if you get one of these on a triangle, then good news because there's a formula on the formula sheet known as the Pythagorean Pythagorean theorem. So let's take note of this. This is the main thing you have to understand. The Pythagorean theorem gives the relationship, the theorem, it gives the relationship between the three sides of a right triangle. So what does this mean to us? This means any time you have a single triangle, so one triangle, with one missing side, but you have to know the other two. As long as you know the other two, but you know the other two. Use this formula to find the missing side. Okay, so I'm talking about this formula. I'm talking about this formula. As of yet, you haven't seen this formula. So let's go ahead and take a look at it. Let's go ahead and take a look at this formula. I have it right here. So here's an example of the GED formula sheet. This is going to be one of your drop down options when you go to take your test. And we see a lot of area, perimeter, surface area at the top. But come down here and look at the bottom and look at this Pythagorean theorem. Do you see it? And there's that relationship, a squared plus b squared equals c squared. In fact, a lot of you just started going, oh, I know that relationship. My teacher used to always talk about that, and I never used to pay attention. So, <laughs> well, you're paying attention now, so here we go. Let's give this a try. So let me just bust out my writing tool here so I can try this. So uh, the first step whenever you work with a formula is you need to write the formula down. I know you guys hate to do this. You're like, why am I wasting my time writing down the formula? Well, as a mathematician, um, when you go into your college classes, um, you are going to need to communicate to your teacher that you're starting with a truth. By starting with a formula, you're saying, here is a true relationship that everybody in math assumes to be true. And you, uh, once you start with that truth, then we accept that we're all on the same page and you can go on from there. And as long as you keep doing true things, you should get to a true answer. So here I have this. Now it's super important to understand that when you look at the Pythagorean theorem, the A, B, and the C matter. Which ones are which? So the deal is the A and B are the legs of the right triangle. Legs of a right triangle. Oh my gosh, this is a horrible tool, by the way, for doing this. But the legs of the right triangle form the L around that right angle. These are the legs. So the A and the B are the legs. And you're probably thinking, Kate, which one's A, which one's B? And I'm like, doesn't matter, okay? Just as long as you have the two legs labeled A and B. And then the hypotenuse, the one across from the right angle, is the C, okay? So let's plug into this. So you can see here I've been given my A and my B because I know my legs, but I don't know my C on this problem. So I'm going to, and let me change my color so you can really see what I'm doing. I want you guys to see this because sometimes you miss it. My A is 8. I'm going to plug in an 8. And again, you say, how do I know which one's A and which one's B? Doesn't matter as long as they're legs. And my B is 6. I'm going to plug in a 6. Now, when you plug into a formula, your letters, you substitute for the letters you know, but nothing else is going to change. So let me just pick up my black. I'll still have my square. I'll still have my plus. I'll still have my square. And I still have my equals C squared. Okay, we all good with that. That's known as your substitution step. When you just take the formula, put in the numbers you know. You haven't done any math yet. And like if you were in my college or my high school math class, I would have given you two points already for just for knowing these two things, even if you didn't know how to do any of the algebra. At least you knew what formula you needed and you put in the right numbers. Okay, but now for the GED, we actually have to get to the answer here. 
I mean, don't get me wrong, you always have to get to the answer even in your college class, but no partial credit on the GED, right? So we got to go all the way. A lot of students get overwhelmed by this, but I'm like, guys, just start with math you know how to do first. So I'm going to completely ignore the right-hand side of the equation for now. I'm ignoring this C squared, and I'm looking over here at this left-hand side because there's all kinds of work I know how to do. I know how to square 8. I know how to square uh, 6. I know how to add. So let's go ahead and do that. Now, according to the order of operations, I need to take care of these exponents before I do the addition. So let's do that. Okay, um, 8 squared is 64. So I replace 8 squared with 64, and 6 squared simplifies to 36. So I replace 6 squared with 36. Now, I have not yet used my addition, so it drops. My equal sign drops, and I don't know what C squared is. Do you know what C squared is? You don't, because we don't know what C is, so we just leave it. Leave it, okay? Now, there's more math I know how to do. Hello, I know how to add two numbers. Well, oh my goodness, let's add them. Now, I don't care where you add them. You can do it in your calculator. You can do it in your head. You can do it in scratch paper. Shoot, you can call your girlfriend and ask her what 64 plus 36 is. But I promise you, it's 100. So I write the answer to that down there, and I keep my equals, and I keep my C squared. So up until now, we haven't really been doing algebra. We've been doing arithmetic. This is math. This is simplifying. Now's the time where the algebra kicks in. I have no more math I can do forwards. There's nothing to do on this left-hand side. On this right-hand side, how can I square a number that I don't even know what it is? So now it's time to start solving, working to get the letter alone. Anytime you want to solve, you do the opposite of what's happening. So I see right now C is being squared, but I want C to be by itself. And so I'm going to do the opposite of squaring. The opposite of squaring is square rooting. Now the rule of algebra is you can make any change you want to make, any one, literally, as long as you balance your change. Whatever you do to one side, you do to the other. So if I take the square root of the right side, I'm also going to take the square root of the left side. Okay. Now on this side, square and square root cancel, leaving me with just C because they're opposites, they cancel each other out. And there's to work to do. The square root of 100 uh, is 10 because what number times itself equals 100? Well, 10 does. Okay, so we're almost done here, but remember that final answers need units, okay? So if this was in feet and this was in feet, guess what? That measurement is also in feet. So my final answer for this problem is 10 feet. Ah, tried to circle it. 10 feet! <laughs>